Hello, Murray from Paola from Geneva. And Hello. who else is with you? <laughs> who else is with you? Can you introduce me to the other people who are with you? Ah, Marc and Noe. Marc and Noe, hi. We talked yes. on the phone. I didn't know you by face. Hello, how are you? Fine, thank you. We are being followed then, uh, by 82 countries afternoon. and 4,000 people uh, so far. So, Patrick Willemans, I am president of the Hotel Metropole. So we have the... Then uh, the discussions are still going on, so it's the other two people... Sorry? David Gross. Uh, I'm saying that the discussions are still going on. Okay, so then, then can I just ask a question myself, on behalf of everybody, yes. to Murray? Back in 1927, Murray, the highlight of the Solvay conference, the first one, were two brand new ideas, relativity and quantum mechanics. Today, 68 years later, these, top, these topics are still very much hot in physics. What are the most exciting topics in physics, according to you, in physics today? What are the most exciting topics? There are many mysteries still. More and more, they seem to be connected with a simultaneous consideration of elementary particles out of which all uh, matter is constructed on the one hand, and uh, the uh, character of the universe on the other. Uh, for a long time, these were separate subjects, studies, come together very, very much. Many of us have realized it, and it's uh, in the uh, interrelation between the study of the very small and the study of the very large that uh, most of the really interesting issues uh, emerge today. So, for example, uh, the uh, recent discoveries about the expansion of the universe, showing that instead of being slowed down by the attraction of gravity, the expansion of the universe is actually accelerated, means that most probably we are back to the famous or notorious cosmological constant. And uh, one now has a value for it from these observations of the acceleration and the expansion. But that value, if you try to estimate it crudely in terms of fundamental quantities, 18, the largest fudge factor in the history of science. Why is that? It's an example of the mysteries that are encountered today. I've seen uh, your colleagues have joined you, Murray. I see David Gross. Yes, so yes, indeed. David Gross and Gerhard Tort just all with joined you. us. Yes. So now we are all, all here. David Gross is the convener of the conference. Can I ask, David, what is the theme of this 2005 edition of Solvay? Uh, the theme is the quantum nature of space and time. The, uh, how do we uh, marry quantum mechanics, which has been used so successfully for describing the microscopic, atomic, and subnuclear world, with Einstein's theory of dynamical space-time. Um, and in trying to do so, there are many puzzles that arise, many new attempts, such as string theory and others that have been, um, that we're exploring to try to construct a consistent theory of space and time and understand both what truly happens at the microscopic level and also what controls the, the large-scale structure of the universe. I think Mick has a question for... Yes. Um, just to put things in a historical context, uh, are you actually sitting in the hotel which Einstein sat in back in 1927? And have things changed much there? Oh, yes. So, uh, it's the same hotel as uh, the hotel where uh, the, conference, the first survey conference took place in 1911. And we, have, uh, thought, we are fortunate that uh, the present owner of the hotel is actually the grandson, if I'm not wrong, with the owner of the hotel in 1911. So the tradition has been maintained on all fronts, if I can say so. 
And we, we wanted to be here precisely because it's the same hotel. So uh, the Solvay Institutes are uh, very happy to have maintained the tradition of conferences since 1911, the 23rd edition, and uh, the tradition of the location is also being uh, preserved. Do you have anybody there? Maybe Mr. Willemann. A few words. So that's right that in 1911, the first Congress of Physics Solvay was organized here in Brussels at the Hotel Metropole. My great grandfather was a friend of Ernest Solvay at that time. Lawrence was here with Einstein, Rutherford, Marie Curie, and very famous people. In 1995, 10 years ago, we had here a Congress of Chemistry Solvay with Ilya Prigogine, and Ilya Prigogine was the last Belgian to receive a Nobel Prize. And today we have so the Congress of Physics Solvay on the quantum structure of time and space with Mr. David Gross. And we are very happy to have that in Brussels. And we are very happy that the royal family Belgium has very good relations with the Institute So This morning, Prince Philip was here. He is the son of King Albert II of Belgium, so the royal family of Belgium since 1911 has many relations with the International Survey Institutes. I think our oh. audience in the Industrial Museum in Kerkrade, Holland, have prepared a question for their compatriot, Gerard Toft. Do we have Industrian with their question to solve? We are video conferencing at the same time with you in Brussels, with Kerkrade in the Netherlands, with London, and with Finland, Vanta. Yes, there they are. Go ahead, ask your question. Was there some form of time or space before the Big Bang, and how do we know that? Did you get that question? Well, the best way to ask that question is to talk uh, about time zero, the moment of the so-called Big Bang and to uh, ask the question in terms of the time squared, time times itself, and say, what happened when t squared was less than zero? And then there are sensible answers to that. If you ask what happened when t is less than zero, that's not such a good question. And uh, there's a time when t squared was less than zero, then the, uh, uh, the universe had uh, four spatial dimensions instead of three spatial dimensions at one time. Well, that issue was discussed just a few minutes ago, but uh, there's, I don't think, a general consensus. Some people think that it actually was a bounce rather than a bang. Uh, some people think that time became Euclidean. That's what uh, I'm talking about. That's more or less what you're talking about. But uh, uh, opinions diverge. I haven't yet spoken out what I think, but uh, <laughs> in the meeting, but uh, I think there really was just a sharp beginning, or possibly a time such that the replacement of time to minus time makes no difference. It could be that uh, there simply was a symmetry point at, the, uh, at time zero. And so time minus 10 seconds is the same thing as time plus 10 seconds. There could also be an option. Uh, so I think the truth of the matter is that it's probably a very premature question. And uh, we still have to understand the laws of physics a lot better before we can meaningfully discuss the boundary conditions. So right now, all we are doing is speculating. Uh, one question here, just to start with. Do we have a theory that is better than Einstein's principle of relativity? Well, Einstein's general theory of relativity is the theory of gravitation. And uh, a wonderful classical, brilliant classical theory of gravitation. But uh, how to put it into quantum mechanics? Uh, and uh, the uh, a lot of work on that is being done by uh, studying something called superstring theory, which I'm sure you've heard, and trying to construct a serious unified theory of all the particles. By generalizing 
superstring theory. Superstring theory by itself doesn't seem to uh, have the necessary self-consistency. But by adding things to it, some theorists hope to find a series theory of all the particles and all the forces that would incorporate Einstein's uh, uh, general relativity successfully into quantum mechanics. The reason that people suspect that superstring theory might do that, might help with that, is that in superstring theory, in a suitable approximation, you actually get Einstein's theory uh, in quantum mechanics. Professor Gross, do you agree? Do you agree? Uh, I certainly agree. I certainly agree with, it, with, it, with the, everything that Murray Gellman just said. Um, you know, in physics, we don't. I, I felt a bit uh, uncomfortable with the idea that this is better than Einstein's theory. We're just uh, exploring more deeply and trying to do things that Einstein's theory didn't address, such as unifying gravity, Einstein's theory of space time, with the other forces of nature, which uh, weren't understood when Einstein formulated his theory. And now we, we, we believe that it, it's quite natural. We even have indications that at very high energies, these forces seem to become are, are similar and are of equal strength and should be unified. So I, I doubt whether the theory will be better. It will just address more questions and answer some of the paradoxes that seem to arise if one um, combines Einstein's theory with quantum mechanics. It's a very nice way to put it. I have a question here from my co-host, Nick. Yes. Uh, it's really a, a question and a, and a message from you in Solvay to young people out on the internet who may be studying physics or maybe considering studying science or maybe considering giving up physics or science. I imagine that back in the 1920s when uh, great names like Heisenberg, Planck, uh, Einstein were attending Solvay conferences that, that everything seemed to be extremely exciting and exhilarating this is the idea that I have, I might be wrong. Uh, today, do you detect the same excitement in physics? And if you do, what are the exciting things that you, that you think physicists are facing today? What message do you have for the young people who are studying science? I think it's much more exciting than it was in 1920. Uh, there are many, as, I mean, the questions that we're asking today questions that we're asking during this conference are very exciting. I think even more exciting than the structure of the atom. We're asking about how the universe began. We just discussed that. The ultimate nature of space and time. We're trying to understand what the universe, we've now discovered that most of the matter in the universe is not the stuff that we're made out of. What is it made out of? How does it work? Uh, we have this strange negative pressure or so-called dark energy that causes the universe to accelerate. Where does that come from and why is it what it is? That's what I was calling the cosmological It's a different name to say. I think it's never been more exciting and um, all of these wonderful questions that we're debating now, believe me, will not be resolved during this conference. Plenty of work and excitement and discovery for all the young people to make that the younger generations should not be discouraged by a mistaken idea that everything really has been solved today. Sometimes you hear uh, commercials about string theory being the theory of everything. So, um, I actually don't believe it has any, come any way close to that. So uh, the enormously large numbers of puzzles which are still perplexing and we really need the young and fresh minds of, of, of people coming after us who come with brilliant ideas to add order to the complete chaos that we are in today. So it's, we are very far away from theory of everything. Uh, also, uh, another, another important point is that the theory of everything is not a very good name in this connection because this, whatever, whatever we get It will not describe everything that's found in nature. Uh, 
because what's found in nature, the history of the universe, is depends on the fundamental laws and on an unimaginably long sequence of chance events or accidents. And so the theory, but even when it's found, will not be anything like a theory of everything. Most of the information of the universe has to do with those accidents, those chance events, and uh, only a small portion relates to the fundamental theory because the fundamental theory is probably simple. Thank you very much. Okay, we have another question. question from the email. Okay, we got uh, one question from the uh, Purdue University in, in uh, Indiana saying, why does C, the speed of light, have only one dimension and why does it have the value it has? Is this an accident or due to some factors presently known or unknown? Kilometers are arbitrary. The second is arbitrary, <laughs> and so, and the, but the velocity of light, far from being arbitrary, is the standard for the, for the whole universe. Does anyone want to add anything on that? Uh, the velocity of light is the way we is, 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 is simply the way we relate time to space. Yes. And it, uh, in, in the unit we like to use is equal to one. <laughs> so there are three such numbers in nature. The light is one of them. The Planck's constant is another such constant. You can ask why does it have the value it has, but in reality it does have that value because we find it to have that value. And uh, you can measure everything else with respect to it. And the third constant in nature is Newton's constant of gravity, which also has, we could also put that equal to one. Once you put those three numbers equal to one, all the other numbers are things which are fixed by laws of nature, of which it's our job to try to understand. Or maybe sometimes by accident. Or maybe, very well, <laughs> maybe those that. things are, de are, are determined by accident. And that's indeed one of the issues being the, this meeting. How much of the laws of nature is due to accidents, and how much of that is actually computable? And this, uh, we know right now that what we call the standard model of physics of, of elementary particles is controlled by 26 numbers of which we don't know who or what determined them. Have they been determined by accident or is there a way to compute those numbers? This we don't know and it's a very deep and important question. One of those many still open questions that we are discussing. And a very good reason for seeking a unified theory which we hope will explain I think we have time for two more questions. I would give one to Industrium Kerkrade in the Netherlands and the next to London. So Kerkrade first. Please go ahead. Uh, if the, most of the old theories are proven wrong by the new ones, so is it, is it, is it possible that the new ones are also proven wrong in the future? We have to realize that when a theory supersedes an older theory, especially in fundamental physics, the older theory tends to survive as an approximation. So, for example, you know that, uh, physics is quantum mechanical, but quantum classical physics can still be used, for instance, for calculating the orbit of the planets, because the quantum effects are so tiny, they're negligible. Similarly, for very low speeds and low, small gravitational fields. Uh, one can use uh, pre-Einstein uh, uh, Newtonian uh, physics, uh, and it's good enough for many purposes. So the old theory is not simply thrown away in many cases. In many cases, it lies as a very useful approximation. Thank you, Professor Gellman. most Gellman. cases, to add to that, yeah, Professor Dorf, in most yes. cases, to add to that, uh, the old theories are stepping stones for the new theories. You can't even imagine the new theory without first completely understanding the old one. And the old one is at the basis, and the old one has a very fundamental uh, reason of existence and a very fundamental truth to it. But you can't understand the entire world 
only using a tool theory, you have to add new things to them. So the new theories are usually additions, not replacements. I'd like to thank you, Professor Gelman, Professor Toft, and Professor Gross. I thank you, Mark and Noe, and the Hotel Metropole for being with us. This has been one of the highlights, I think the highlight of our webcast, but more is to come. And London is going to take on from now for the next one and a half hours on web, internet, grid, and neutrinos. But before we hand over to London, let's just say thank you to our guests, Rolf and Anne Sylvie at CERN, for taking part in this CERN part of the show. Thank and you very Mike, much. Mike, Andre, and Davide. And of course, our friends from the LHC. And we wish you every success, and we hope that you get it running in 2007, as you say. There Thank is a you. question for you, but it's offline. <laughs> we now have to give the floor to London. Thank you.